All right, welcome everybody. Uh, it is my privilege and honor and, and joy, I suppose, uh, to introduce uh, Vibhu uh, Srinivasan. Uh, kind of, we were talking before the uh, event this evening, and I learned more about his life story. And I hope you don't mind, Vibhu, I'm gonna share a little bit of, uh, uh, of what, what you shared with me. So um, he's originally from uh, a hill station in Tamil Nadu, uh, India. And uh, while he was growing up, moved to Mumbai and kind of from there got on the, you know, the engineering track and uh, landed at uh, Tata Consulting Services. And somewhere along the way, uh, as, he, as, as I'm recalling the story he just told me, met somebody from Melbourne, Australia and thought that sounded really, really cool. And so tried to get on a project in Melbourne and succeeded, except it was Melbourne, Florida. And uh, so instead of going to Australia, he ended up here in the States in Florida and uh, ended up encountering extreme programming and kind of got himself immersed in that and you know met some of the early movers and shakers and and learned about that. And it was really sounds like kind of the start of his agile journey. Uh, along the way, he's lived in Milwaukee, which is uh, actually when I was a kid, I lived outside of Milwaukee. So we got to bond about Milwaukee a little bit. Uh, then moved to Seattle and joined Solutions IQ. And it was while he was there that the two of us met. We figured out it was in 2009 uh, at Agile Open Northwest, which is an open space conference that bounces back and forth between Portland and Seattle. Um, been to it many times, absolutely love it. And uh, so yeah, that's where we connected. Um, uh, he joined Solutions IQ, that's what got him up to Seattle. And at some point, uh, had the opportunity and started Solutions IQ India. So moved back, right, and was in Bangalore for a number of years. Uh, Accenture bought Solutions IQ in 2017. So uh, along with that came, you know, he went, uh, and that let him in, let him return back to Seattle where he is uh, currently. Uh, he's a certified scrum trainer. He has his own uh, uh, company and website as well, Agilis, agilis.co. Uh, he's got a son in college and a daughter about to head off to college, so big changes in life uh, coming along. And, uh, and he's currently a director at the Accenture Technology Innovation Group. So uh, without any more ado, uh, it's your show. That is so awesome, Chris. I want you to introduce me every time. This is so cool. So that lets me uh, skip that introduction, but thank you for that, Chris. So I am a big fan of Chris. Um, I first met him in uh, Agile Open Northwest and learned a couple of games and, and sort of uh, ever since I've been uh, following Chris and learning from him. So thank you for letting me be here and speak today, right? So uh, I was gonna just share again, any time today, it's a smaller group. If you have questions, um, please put it in the um, chat and then, Chris is monitoring it, and if if we'll pick it up as we go. Um, and so I'm going to uh, just share a screen just for context. I put some um, uh, some things just so we can talk about it. Um, and I will also share a document at the end so you can sort of read through for some of you who may want to uh, just read stuff, you know. Um, but I'm going to um, just just make sure that you can see this first, you know. Um, yep. Can you see this? You know. Yeah, looks pretty good. Okay. So um, I want to start by you know. Um, um, this, I think we've already covered my movement across the world, you know, so I'm going to skip that, but thank you for covering that, Chris. So, um, so um, what do I do today, right? So I do lead a group called Liquid Studios in Accenture. And uh, one of the things that happened in my life was I learned about XP early on, uh, and then I learned about Scrum, you know, in 2006, and then a lot of things have changed over time. So today's talk, um, or, or it's more of a discussion, right? So um, is sort of this idea, not an idea, but something that we do in our group, my group here in um, Liquid Studios, uh, we sort of believe, uh, we believe that every team can innovate, you know, and so my goal was to just share some of the practices that we do, um, some of the, and, and I know many of you are already probably practicing Scrum, may know a lot of these topics, and then if you know this, then please share your perspective on this, um, and, and we'll go like that, right, so um, so that's our goal. Um, so what I want to sort of take away today is like, so why 
Now I want to sort of question like why every team should innovate, you know, and maybe what is blocking them, which is some of the conversations you just had. Uh, I'm going to connect with that in a second, you know, uh, and then um, we, we talk about some basic skills that maybe our teams are missing, um, what we can bring, share with you some trends that we are seeing in technology, um, and then maybe share a document in the end for you to read, and then we'll have Q&A and questions like that. And I think, Chris, how much time do I have? 30 minutes, I said, you know. Um, you know, if you target finishing roughly about eight, but if you go over or under, okay. it, it's not tragic yeah. at all. Eight is good, you know. So um, so that is the goal. So what is the agenda, right? So I think, um, you know, we have sort of start with, you know, I want to start with this kind of what is, what does the innovation mean, you know? Um, and then, um, you know, we have all these tools in the Agile toolbox, right? We now talk about design thinking or Lean Startup or Agile or Scrum, Kanban, Scrumban all of those things. I want to share you like a, a story of something that a couple of things that we have built and how we went about building them. Um, some of then this concept of dual track agile, which some of you may know, and then we sort of close with some, um, uh, just a quick document readout and then uh, pick up any questions and discuss, right? So that's the plan. Again, just some general working agreement. You know, if you can ask questions, uh, maybe first put it in the chat, that way Chris can see it. Um, hopefully it's fun for you. I know it's evening, I'll keep it uh, conversational. Um, and fun, you know, and then um, share your ideas. If you agree or disagree with me, we would like to know that, right? So um, so with that, right? So um, this was kind of the question, right? Like, why is innovation tough? I think that's, um, you know, why why is innovation a challenge, right? Um, and that's sort of your opening question. So for some of you who are in the, in the uh, rooms, right? So any particular things that you, um, that you guys discuss, you remember from your, um, from your team room, opening chat, what were those if you can share with us, you know, let's type a few of them, you know. That... Frequent resource turnover. Turnover, you know, okay. What Feel else? free to unmute and speak or just uh, drop it in the chat. Ooh, day-to-day -day work from the chat. Okay, anything else? Uh, dealing with the emergency of the day from the chat. Yeah. Uh, lack of support from management for innovation. Yeah. Uh, being in reactive mode sounds a little bit like the emergency of the day, but maybe a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. So these are all, you know, valid points, right? I mean, we are all in organizations and we face these challenges. And, and in, in many organizations, you know, uh, we see these kind of hackathons and, you know, like I know in one of the customers, they have like an innovation week and everybody is put into this idea generation thing. And generally like 99% of ideas that come out of these innovation weeks and things never see the light of the day, right? So they're all nice, you know, it feels good, you know, at that point, but later on, nothing actually comes to light, right? So, so I want to just open up like a discussion around, you know, um, so when we say innovation, right, what do we mean by that, you know, um, and, and, um, and like, you know, just, and this is going to be a mix and match of some definitions, right? So typically, right, some discoveries, right, like those are like bigger inventions, like the bulb, you know, like the, the car, I mean, those are all big things, you know, so we could be finding something absolutely big and, you know, that, that's a, maybe an invention, more so like an innovation, right? Um, we could be taking an existing technology and repurposing it for something completely new, right? Like a sticky note is a great example, right? Um, it was meant for something else and who knew we're going to stick things with it, you know? Um, so sometimes you are devising a new business model that was earlier hidden, right? So, so if COVID is, an, you know, is a great example of um, whatever we thought is not possible, you know, like as a belief that we all had has been fundamentally cha challenged by all of us, you know, like, for example, you know, we would say something like you cannot work from home, you know, everybody has to work face to face. And in fact, Agile Manifesto says, you know, face to face is the best way to work. And anything that we talked about, so a lot of the companies have sort of fundamentally reinvented their business model, right? And how they do work. If they don't, they don't exist, right? Um, and also like bringing a new product or a service to a new location or a set of new customers, right? So it's not just always about like some, you know, crazy idea. It could be any of these kind of different kinds of things, right? So that is sort of the definition that was in that Lean Startup book by Eric Ries, you know, um, and, and, and which I agree with, right? But there is sometimes a difference between, you know, um, 
innovation and invention, right? So, so in my example today, I'm talking about something called incremental innovation, right? So uh, you could be disruptive and change something big, you know, those are nice, you know, those are things we can also do, but we could also be as a process, you know, incrementally changing something, making it better. Um, and it's adding value that doesn't exist before, right? So, um, so those are also, um, those are all possible if we allow our teams to do uh, work like that, right? So, um, so that's um, something to think about, right? So, um, um, so if you have, so that's just, you know, so when we think about innovation, right, typically, uh, we talk about there is always an innovation group, like, you know, or there is a, a small group in organizations or hackathons, right? But what I wanted to think about is like, how can we create a system where can every team innovate? So what kind of skills do we need so that any team you have sort of brings new ideas to market um, and, and how do we create that, right? So what can we do to do that? Um, and so like many of the things that you're talking about earlier, right? So the culture, right? So there is this idea of um, fail-proof thinking that many of our organizations work with. Like for example, funding is a great example, right? We only get funding when things are nicely lined up. You know, um, We actually fund projects and we don't fund teams or fund ideas, right? So, um, so um, encouraging trial and error you know, without co any consequence is not really there in most companies. Uh, if it is there, it's maybe in small pockets of organizations. So from a leadership perspective, a lot of the things we have set up or organization that's set up is against us innovating, right? So the bigger the organization that we see, the worse the ideas get. Like, so uh, we recently worked with uh, one of the companies where they intentionally brought our teams because while they could, they were fully capable of innovating, the problem they had was like, um, just the red tape in the company would not allow them to move any further. So we created these small teams, which were able to uh, cut the red tape. So we set up a startup, but, you know, they had a couple of developers, we added a couple of developers, right? And within 12 weeks, we actually had a product live in the market. And so they were like surprised with their own, like, how did this happen? You know, uh, and, and then we actually got around 3000 customers in 12 weeks for this new, it was a pet, um, kind of a pet watch, right? So it was a pet watch for, uh, um, it's like, if you have uh, Apple watch for pets, you know, something like that is what was built. Um, and in a matter of like a few months, right? So um, so the, the, the issue mainly, many things are true, but our organizational culture and the um, shape of our organization uh, and the processes we have often impede our ability to do something creative, right? Um, so, um, so what? So th that's just some just some opening topics around uh, how you know. So what do we do in in our Liquid Studio group? Um, a little bit around is like so uh, we have small teams, um, and we necessarily. Um, you know, when you think about ideas, right? So every idea. I mean, if you can go to any company, right? Um, you ask about an idea, everybody has tons of ideas. And in most companies, ideas die in the sticky note, right? It dies in mural boards, it dies in Miro, right? It never makes the progress. So what we have intentionally set up uh, in Liquid Studio is these are like uh, what we call as like um, small teams and every team has got um, like a designer, you know, so we call them creative technologists. And, and we also have a couple of, maybe in some cases, data scientists, we could have a couple of developers. Uh, really the team is not, you know, when you think about Scrum, right? So there's this idea of a fixed team. Um, we don't really put fixed teams. We have teams that have, you know, that gets formed based on the problem that comes along. And, and so we had a group of around um, 200 people. We have around, you know, um, six studios in the US and around 12 or more in Europe. And each of these studios have around 20 or so people. So collectively, we have an idea back, like our customers have all these problems they want to solve. And then we, you know, if you're interested to do something, you can jump in. And we don't necessarily look at, you know, um, you having to know something to jump into that. We just want you to have that interest. And over time, you're going to build these things. So these small teams keep on forming in the work we do. But what they're trained to do over time is to not just leave an idea, but also to do like some kind of a quick prototype. So they're trained in sort of rapid prototyping techniques. I'm gonna present a few of them. 
Uh, we also have a way to hand it over to like either the customer to build what is often called as a minimum valuable product, like something that gets launched in front of a customer. Um, and then oftentimes, you know, you may launch it in multiple. So we hand it over to like bigger parts of uh, the customer or within our uh, organization to scale it to like large markets, right? So, so generally we are involved in the first three cycles here, uh, ideate, prototype, and, and, and also quickly uh, MVP, right? So, so that's the group that I'm talking about and uh, it's called the Liquid Studios, right? So, um, so that's, you know, if you look up Liquid Studios, you know, that's what I am part of and, and we are able to deliver um, significant fast value to customers that when they are not able to do it themselves, right? Or we co-create with them they're also part of that and we work together doing these things. So that's just a little bit about, you know, um, things in Scrum and how we have necessarily, we, we do a lot of Agile, but not necessarily the, you know, the right way to do Scrum or the right way to do Kanban. A lot of the things are pretty flexible to our teams and teams are also often forming um, and forming again, right? So there's no concept of you're part of a specific team only, right? So, um, so that's just the first part of what I wanted to present, right? So, and in terms of technology, right? So when we think about technology, um, there's a lot of trends that are changing in the industry, right? So, um, and I want to just share a couple of things that that we have worked in in the last few. In the this is all in the last year or so, right? So, so you can see like, and then I'll give an example of how we went about building something. So, so one of the things that's emerging a lot in the industry is this concept of um, what we call a smart airports, right? So um, now while um and I, i'm going to keep pasting these you know uh, hopefully here as well so you can see them right uh, you can read along with me right so so this was an effort of like well how do we uh, so if you've heard about 5g right so 5g has pretty much now you know it's it's these a kind of millimeter wave you know small cell networks which are able to transmit information much fast much faster a lot more secure right so um now that if you think about the next, so generally what happens with these 5G networks is they have like these 4G, 5G, 3G, all these Gs, right? They actually have like a, um, a 10 year span, right? So so this was work that we recently did like a, maybe a year ago, uh, working with, uh, with uh, Amazon um, in order to bring some of their AR, VR technology uh, in order to just basically you'll not have the concept of check-in like you just go into the airport there's a you know if you allow uh, your picture to be taken and if there's a 5g enabled you know you can just walk in through the airport and it sort of lets you in right so so this product to concept to finish like you know um, followed this exact pattern that i talked about so one of the trends we are seeing a lot is this idea of a smart something right so whether it is a smart airport smart assistant uh, you know and so that's one pattern that's emerging a lot is the use of 5g so i want to spend a few minutes on like what is the, what are the trends right in the industry and what we are seeing you know um the second thing is this concept of you know uh, when you think about edge compute right so um when you think about cloud right pretty much everybody is on the cloud now in some way or the other um so um but then what are you doing with the cloud right so so now that the emergence of cloud has happened, right? So, I mean, everybody is on, you know, some cloud, Google cloud, you know, Alibaba cloud, you know, Azure, GCP, private cloud, right? Um, but now that you have all the data, people are finding new problems, right? Like they're like, well, what do we do with all this stuff, you know? And, and many customers have basically moved a lot of their um, cloud, a uh, lot of their products as is to the cloud. And then now they're feeling all the debt, right? So they didn't really take care of the technical debt. They just moved everything online and that is causing further issues as well right so like now you have carried all your debt into the cloud but now how do you how do you um, benefit from that so a lot of the work we do is sort of bringing in more smartness into what you have in the cloud so one of the things that's emerging a lot especially with this whole 5g thing is the concept of your connected devices so for example your sensors you know your remote units any kind of smart products you may have uh, connects with now what is called as an edge gateway, right? Like, um, for example, um, Amazon has a product called Outpost. There's an equivalent uh, one in in um, in the Microsoft side. So what these edge compute does is it gives you kind of local uh, processing, right? 
So imagine like, um, you know, for example, um, we are working with um, uh, like a large scale, for example, refinery, you know, a lot of the things earlier, they would not be able to do in these refineries before, right? But now that you, now you have a, a, the 5G private network is super powerful, right? Now, because you have a 5G private network, it's running at, so A, you have a super big bandwidth, B, you have very secure, uh, but the problem is if you're going to hit the cloud for each transaction, really you don't benefit from these things. So what is becoming a huge change now is the idea of a edge device, right? So, so your sensors and you know your edge processing, like video photography that comes from a, a, a like a um, from a refinery, all of that gets processed locally. And now they, we have sort of that's the the emergence of the hybrid cloud, right? So so you may have like a, a local kind of an outpost or some local processing of you know your cloud infrastructure in on premise, and then for some things only we may hit the back and we'll hit the uh, cloud, right? So and so along with that, there's this emergence of digital twins, you know. So basically, um, like you can twin your entire factory or you can you can simulate the entire thing on top of it right so 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 what what's con the next few years are all around these connected devices you know especially with the emergence of 5g a lot of the things we can do um, that we thought is possible now it's easy to do them and also the emergence of the cloud and all the features available on top of that like you know running like an ml algorithm you know while earlier was you know only specialists can do it now APIs have been exposed and people could misuse it in ways that it's not there, right? So, so that's a general second trend. So use of 5G um, cloud along with the cloud, the idea of edge computing, which is sort of the future that's emerging, right? So, um, so um, uh, again, a lot of what I'm talking, I wanna post here. So, uh, and again, guys, pause if you have any things, you know, you wanna ask questions, but so that is the second emergence of trend is the concept of, um, you know, edge computing and as they come along and how we work with that, right? And we, do so, have a, we do have a question in the chat uh, from Katrina. Um, after developing the MVP, how is the product transferred to another team to scale? That's right. So, so one of the challenges, um, yeah, I, I'll answer that, right? So like one of the things we see is like, if you, anytime you hand over something, right? There is a cost of that going on. So what we tend to do is we have one of our team members will continue into the other team. Um, so generally it goes to um, the customer will have like a IT you know, department or whatever product team, uh, or even within Accenture, we'll have our large scale development centers in India, Philippines or US dev centers, along with customers will then pull from there, right? Because we are just 200 people, 100 and 200 people globally. We don't have the capacity to do all of this stuff. So we, um, but we, we, our goal is to kill the idea as soon as possible, right? So we don't want bad stuff going into production. So many times when we are looking at an idea and like somebody said, that's a cool idea. We just want to validate really quickly. Like we want to fail fast, you know, like do something and validate those ideas. So we, we hope that, you know, 60 to 70 percent of things we produce may not make it to production because many customers tend to do that. And we are trying to like show them with data that those things may not be required, right? So, um, so it's a lot of like, and, and many times like, you know, uh, customers will say, we want these hundred features in production. And then when we actually build them and show them maybe four of them is what they needed, right? So, so um, yeah, I'll go into that, some of that discussion around how to scale soon, right? So I just want to show you like, um, what's the industry trending, right? So, uh, and then we'll go into that, right? So, so if you think about like uh, a lot of these things, right? Um, it's not possible for, uh, one developer team or one team to know a lot of these technologies, right? So that's why, you know, um, uh, I just want to show this other article as well. So you can read them along with me if you are like trying to figure out, right? So, so how do we create teams that are generally fearless of whatever you throw at them, right? So like, so some of our developers, we have general skills, but we don't want our developers to be like, smart in AI or must be a deep, you know, five PhDs in ML, but all of our team members collectively divide and conquer. So there may be a data scientist we depend upon. There may be like, a, a, so we, we are looking at the team skills um, than just the, you know, just the individual skills of people. So, so some of the skills, so one of the things that people notice is a debt called knowledge debt, right? So, so when we have dev teams in organizations, we often see that they, you know, if you don't invest in these things, 
they're not going to catch up and just learn, you know, some edge compute or whatever that needs to be learned, right? Um, we need to invest in people to do those things. So, so the technologies that are kind of focus area for us, right? So uh, one is called smart materials, you know? Um, so, so we are of, often looking at some futuristic technologies uh, along with uh, solving customer problems. So uh, smart materials are like, you know, um, uh, imagine you're watching, uh, especially now with uh, Facebook doing this whole meta thing, right? Uh, if you're wearing an Oculus, for example, you know, um, if you, um, I don't know if you tried an Oculus, right? You can do like, a, let's say a roller coaster drive in Oculus. Well, the problem is you don't really um, feel the wind, right? So, so what, um, what these um, haptic materials do is you can put it on your skin, you know, and it will actually give you a warmth or cold air, you know, so we can simulate the kind of the haptics uh, feelings along with it. So smart material is an area where it it's something that we are focusing on along with like uh, quantum computing, right? So where machines are now, it's possible to do large com um, computes in a different way. So we are always looking at a couple of things. So not everyone in, in my team knows uh, smart materials. Maybe there's five of them, right? Um, then there is a couple of people who are really good in like AI and ML, right? We have a couple of these. So for each of these areas, we have some senior folks who actually, not senior, but people are very good at these things. But in general, the team members may reach out to any of these people for ideas, right? So what we're trying to do is mix and match. So that's sort of what we do, right? Now, uh, moving on, right? So Gartner sort of confused, right? If you look at, I don't know if many of you have seen this, this is a picture published by Gartner, right? And if you look at this, right, so um, it, it, uh, it introduces this, you know, design thinking, then it says, well, then we can like a lean startup and agile working together. This was published by Gartner, right? So when you see something from Gartner, and if you are a, like a CTO or a CEO or a CFO, what's their first, what do you think about this picture? What's your thought on this, you know? Anyone has an, any feedback on this picture? You know? What are you noticing in this picture? You know, just as you're seeing this, you know. Cyclical nature. Okay. Cyclical nature of certain phases. Yeah. yeah, it looks, I mean, it looks like a little bit of a waterfall here, right? It looks like a sequential process, right? It looks like we do design thinking. So a lot of the people who read this, like read it like, hey, we do design thinking first, you know. Uh, obviously, we need to empathize with the customers. So we do design thinking, we do a couple of ideates, but then we bring in some ideas from lean startup. And then eventually we bring, you know, some kind of a scrum into this, right? The problem is this is not how at least it works, you know? So, so, um, so I just want to show a little bit of like how we may want to do this, right? So, um, so for those of you who, uh, I mean, if you know design thinking, you know, just, and you can always look it up later, but one of the skills that we want every team member in an innovation, every team to learn is the concept of empathizing techniques for working front with your customer, right? So, and, and, the, and uh, like there's lots of stuff online that we can bring to our teams. Um, and especially like the, the D school in Stanford has done a fantastic job. But one of the skills that we really want our each member in our organization to know is how do we do these kind of customer interviews and, you know, um, and typically in organizations, this is done by like a marketing group or somebody who's like a product manager, right? We would not let our team members do that, right? In our case, our teams actually go to the interview. So for example, when we built something for a famous burger chain, you know, um, we actually had our developers sit with like cameras and, and with the permission of the customer across this big burger chain. And we helped them um, speed up the drive. It's a super popular chain and they were just having a serious backlog, uh, so lines building up. So by us sit our actual dev members sitting across the nation watching them, we were able to go back and show the real problem to the customer. We spoke to the customers, understood the problem. And today, if you go back, that that is, that's, we have fixed the problem of the queue, right? It gets much faster through their massively demand-based uh, system, right? So one of the things we want each of our teams to learn is this idea of, and again, we don't need to do the entire loop, but can we at least have all our team members learn how to kind of do these kind of interviews, do shadowing, right? Like, like so things we could learn from the design thinking process, right? Um, and then similarly, from a lean startup perspective, right? 
there's a lot of ideas that you know we, if you have read eric kreese's book on lean startup there's lots of ideas that we could possibly talk about but you know like there are a couple of things for example there's one here called fake door right so fake door is you know any team is able to put an idea uh, in um, uh, it's not in the main site so for example uh, you launch like the the pet product we launched um, it actually never came on the real company's website it came as a startup completely outside so nobody knew that 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 belonged to that company right but people are starting to use it then the, the main company said okay now if we have a fake door let's pull from there so so what is again the problem we have in most companies is everyone doesn't know these things only a couple of people in the in the design group know these things so how do we bring some of these skills from a lean startup perspective into every team right um and 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 on top of it we want the agile ways of working right and and when you um when you think about agile ways of working right so um the the problem we see is in many companies that i go to um what is the biggest question executives ask when they work with scrum teams what do you guys notice like this, why is my team not having this what is this you know what do you see is that every exec ask that question i want more of this you know anyone has an any any thoughts on that you know Well, I get one frequently that makes me shake my head and say, okay, we have to have a conversation. Uh, and that one is always velocity. Exactly, right. 10 points to Gryffindor, right? So uh, <laughs> velocity, right? And in fact, the person who brought this concept, I've had some conversations with the person who wrote, Mike Cohen wrote this book on agile estimation. And, and they this has fundamentally confused every industry. So what we are trying to do is like, uh, kicking a washing machine and asking it to wash any faster, it's not going to do. Every team has a, a certain thing, right? So this kind of a model where generally when we do this outside in Agile, uh, where we focus on like, hey, uh, when I meet a Scrum team, they say, hey, Scrum doesn't work. We want to do Kanban, right? When I meet a Kanban team, they say, Kanban, I hate Kanban. I'm going to do Scrum because fundamentally what they're doing is wrong. They're going in what is called outside in agility. What we want to do is go inside out agility, right? So, uh, and what, do, and, and that, and, and, and so uh, that's, and I'll talk to you in a minute, what I mean by that, right? So, and then really focus on the agile values and principles gives you a lot. And then add on to that a couple of design thinking and lean startup techniques. You're going to see a lot more benefit in these teams and less focus on Scrum, Kanban, XPTs are all good. Like, but if we focus only here, we miss the point of a product team. A product team needs a lot more structure, a lot more freedom. Um, and um, you know, those are tougher to do, right? Change your culture, things like that. So, um, so what we can do then, right? Like, so if you notice the book, right? The book was, so we could do design thinking, lean startup and be agile all the way, right? Um, we could just be borrowing lean startup techniques and you know be agile all the way. Notice I'm not saying Scrum, I'm not saying Kanban, I'm just saying being agile, right? Because being agile is different than doing Scrum, right? So a lot of the companies focus on doing Scrum, doing Kanban, and they fundamentally go wrong. What you need to be is be agile, right? So so agile is the mindset, right? And 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 very interestingly, right? When I went to the innovation space, I'm like, those guys are talking about innovation mindset. I'm like, what does that mean? You know? Uh, and then you go to product people, they'll say product mindset. Essentially, a lot of these people are talking, and DevOps people will say the DevOps mindset, right? But it comes down to a little bit of these skills and how we treat our teams, right? So, so in my mind, right, the sort of the modified, you know, it's really not, it's really not around, it's a loop, right? It's not even sequential, you know. You, you want to be doing agile all the way and then mix and match design uh, design thinking and lean startup and kind of work through the loop in, in you know it's it's a back and forth loop it's not a one time kind of a thing right so um because our re real goal is sort of the agile manifesto that's what we are going by right it's like hey our manifesto is like our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software right so that is what we want to focus on um, and less of like, you know, trying to do scrum and getting more velocity because people get tired. I know if you, the problem with forcing people through a backlog, like I have a team in Chicago, every time I meet them, I ask them, how many items do you guys have in a backlog? And they always say, well, we do 3,500 items, you know, and next year, 3,500 items. So people leave the company because they just like feeling like I am not being creative. And, and the work that's being given to teams are just whatever someone decides to put in the backlog, right? So, so what we need to focus on this idea of a, a, 
uh, uh, product centric teams, right? So on how we go about working on that. So let me give an example of a, a project, you know, so you'll see like how that works. You know, I know there's a lot of content here. I'm going to be respect 10 more minutes. I'll finish it in time, you know. So this was a concept that is not a concept, but something that in a, an example of something we built last year, you know. So uh, one of the problems we had was like, uh, I'll actually, you know, maybe I'll just show the video. And that's a two minute video. I won't show the whole thing, but it'll help you visualize this faster than I can say, right? So, um, okay. And, uh, YouTube starts. I have to stop share, share again, and optimize the clip. And I won't show the whole video, but uh, just so you can see it, you know. Um, so it tells does a better job than me explaining it. So yeah, you may want to make it. Cool. The global value in green trade is rising in political and economic importance, topping $2 trillion a year. Two thirds of global consumers are willing to pay more for sustainable goods. Nevertheless, today's economic and social models can still exacerbate inequalities, encourage waste and increase threats to our environment and health. That's partly because the small producers at the beginning of the sustainable supply chain get a mere sliver of the premium price paid for their goods. What if we could empower consumers to directly reward small-scale suppliers around the world that are committed to following sustainable practices? Imagine the impact if more people could fully participate in the growing value of the green economy. With a powerful combination of blockchain, digital identity and payments technologies, we believe this is possible and imperative. Here's how it works. Using an app on their phone, a producer in this case, a coffee farmer creates a profile. At his cooperative, his biometrics and photo for facial recognition are securely captured and verified. Several steps are taken to create his unique identifier using multiple security protocols. This identifier is then recorded on the blockchain, which acts as an index with links to all applicable data, including things like his payment details, so he can receive tips, or his farm's inspection history and organic certifications. This makes it easy to locate, access and share information without the farmer's personal data being stored on the blockchain. The farmer is always in control of their data determining which information is part of their public profile or what details will be linked to a particular product as it moves through the supply chain. He can also use the app as a management tool to keep track of product registrations, check his tip balance, renew certifications and prepare a harvest for shipment. When a shipment is ready and registered, a barcode is automatically generated, embedding information about the coffee, the farmer and his farm, like its organic certification. These details, and each step the shipment takes along the journey, are traceable as it moves across the supply chain, from farmers to processors to grocery store shelves, and finally, to end consumers, where a simple scan not only tells the story of their sustainably sourced coffee and the farmers that grew it, but empowers them to say thank you via a secure tip. So, um... Let me unshare, stop share, share screen without audio and go back here. So um, so the idea is like, so this idea of um, when it came about, I just wanna share the story of where it came about and how did we build it, right? So it came about in one of the idea sessions in, um, in one of the, it was a customer problem they were facing was the end, um, you know, it, the supply chain was so broken down, right? And supply chain is a huge problem right now in this COVID time, right? So so this idea we wanted to prototype, right? So so uh, they said, let's try it out. So we what we did was we, we actually ended up kind of, we went and we built this, uh, I don't know if you see this, uh, in a lab, we started doing a big Lego project. You know, this is like 16,000 Lego pieces, you know, and I didn't know at the time that Seattle actually has the, 
uh, world's largest Lego exhibition, which I didn't know, right? So we went to the Lego exhibition uh, and we wanted to visualize this work, right? So, so we took this um, kind of a model and we hadn't really built anything yet, you know, we just said, let's try this out idea first. So, so we started learning about building this model. And so uh, and then when it finished, it started like, you know, after I got two week sprint, it looked like this, right? So we do weekly kind of work. In a couple of weeks, we got it to this level of perfection. Uh, we actually got a Lego certified expert to work with us and our teams enjoyed doing it. Um, so essentially this is the same thing, right? The farmer, the, where the coffee is stored. There's actually, we have sensors here, you know, which, which are simulating stuff, you know, people can scan the code using an RFID. There are chips in, embedded here. And, and this actually talks to AWS Greengrass, which then uploads it in the back end to AWS, you know. So what we did was we built this model and we took it to a couple of these coffee conferences, you know. Um, we also went to reInvent in Vegas, you know, and we started looking at like, is there interest in this problem, right? So, and we got some serious data that yes, this is a true problem that the customer, like the, then we went and said, let's go build this further, right? And that's the next phase is we actually, that video you, I just showed you, was initially not that good. We just built a lightweight video that goes along with this. And, and so we were trying to just test the product without even having the product, right? And along the journey, we got together and you know we said, let's go build it. And then from there, we entered into this what minimum valuable product phase. So then came along those couple of uh, iPhone apps that I was showing in the screen, along with all the infrastructure needs that come along. And now it's a full blown product and the customer is, they're using it at large scale. So when you buy something at a coffee shop, you should, you know, like you should be able to, for example, get a tip and the farmer actually gets that money, right? But all of this work, ID8, you know, to here to here, took roughly like totally four months, you know, to get it to the full phase. But the, the initial part, there was actually nothing. It was just a Lego model. So we use a lot of Lego modeling. We use like 3D printing. We use just aluminum, cardboard, like all kinds of stuff, you know, just to simulate the idea. A lot of our teams have the creative designers who can just sort of help. And people love that. Like, even though you may be coding, you may come and enjoy this. And even though after COVID, you know, we're still able to do this from remotely in garages and labs, you know, we're able to keep this kind of modeling going on, right? So, so this concept is what generally how we build this one, right? So, um, so to think about this, right? And, and sort of to close, you know, some of the things we're talking about, right? So when you think about many of the teams, right? Um, so when, when you go to the teams and in a lot of the calls, like for example, they're bored, right? They're just like doing the same work for years, right? And, and, and really um, we wanna bring some new excitement to these teams to help them solve new problems, right? So what if we can bring the ideation backlog into the regular work itself, right? So, and this is something that not I was not suggesting. So Jeff Patton, uh, one of our, you know, industry leaders in product management, right? He has been talking a long time about this concept of uh, like discovery loops and development loops and mixing them up, right? So, so essentially every sprint, you deliver a certain amount of um, discovery work as well and certain amount of your regular work as well, right? So you're not really... Uh, you're not really just doing your backlog work, right? So one fundamental shift we need to do to make that happen is rethink Scrum teams or Kanban teams. So what we need to bring is like this concept of these three elements we need in a product team, right? So the first element is the, the concept of product management, you know, comes into the team itself. The concept of um, UX design, right? Like creative technologists or UX design, uh, people who are creative, you know, you need them in the same team. You also need like uh, this kind of engineering team with hardware, you know, software capability. And this team size is not more than, you know, four to six people, right? So, uh, and this is not a fully, you know, persistent team or anything like that. They'll pick an example, like, the, you know, they are picking a project that they like to do from a backlog. So in, in our case, we have a backlog of ideas and teams form. They pull these ideas and then they execute on that and then they move on. So it allows them to build their own capabilities as they go along, right? So, so that's the concept of a kind of a product teams, right? More nowadays we call them value stream teams or, so it's not the design teams are separate, the product management is separate, the in delivery teams are separate. We mix them up and then what you can do is you can scale them up. So like in many, like, you know, there's this, you can scale many of these product teams into a, a product area. And so fundamentally, these are aligned to a value stream then, right? So they're customer facing, they have direct access to customers, 
and they then deliver, for example, some feature of the product or something like that, right? So, and they have both the ideation backlog and the regular backlog, both built in the dual track agile mode. So they have everything built into that. So they're doing both of these with skills of agile, with skills of basically um, some skills from design thinking, some skills from lean startup. And another area that is super important is this concept of storytelling, right? So if you can help our teams get these four skills, you know, um, and then form our teams more like this, that's sort of a one way to get our teams to be innovating more, right? So, um, and uh, so that is sort of, you know, what I wanted to share today. Um, and um, what I did was um, took these things, you know, and uh, I know some of you like to read, you know, so for those of us who like to read, I have put it in this document, uh, which let me stop sharing here. And so, and I'll share back again as soon as I put this in the chat. So um, hopefully you can reach this link, you know, so this is essentially um, all the things I spoke about, you know, uh, if you click the doc, let me see, it should, can you confirm if it opens or something, you know, or yeah, if you can confirm. I'll check it. Uh, yep, absolutely. And yeah, I see people jumping in, you know. Yeah. So this is a live document, like in the sense I keep updating it over time. This is not like a, a conference document or something. This is just like a summary of whatever I spoke about, you know, so you can go back and refer, right? So uh, just to share the screen and walk you through that, you know, and then we'll close and open up for questions, you know. Um, so we uh, you go share the screen. Hopefully you are, what are you seeing? Are you seeing this document now, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so what this covers is like essentially the con the skills we need, right? Um, skills from design thinking, especially the skills of empathizing, you know, um, and then every team to have that skill. Some skills from lean startup, for example, the skill to like, um, you know, um, the concept of a fake door or concierge, right? What does it mean? How do we do it? Uh, I, you know, I sort of compare the two things here. So look at, so you know, which one has got what, they're both, you know, competing things we can steal from both of them in any Agile team, you know. Um, and then uh, there are some um, Agile ways of working that we spoke about, right? Um, we did speak about this concept of like a inside out Agile. And I did speak a bit about culture, you know. And one of the books that has influenced me, I know there's an industry debate whether this is the right model or not. This is called the uh, book called Reengineering Alternative by William Schneider where um, there's, a, there's, there's this basically four cultures, right? In, and these are called micro cultures, not organizational culture, but within the, every leader can help create this culture. So collaboration culture, where we succeed by working together, control culture, where we succeed by getting and keeping control, cultivation culture, where we succeed by growing people who fulfill our vision, you know, so like, like a lot of, uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll finish this. Competence culture is where we succeed by being the best, right? So can you give me an example of where do we see competence culture? Being the best, generally you, you know, you help, you know, you, you celebrate achievement, you know, where do we do that in our life? Which place, you know, competence culture? Anyone wants to share? Yeah. I see silence, you know, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll ask the question again. So um, in which kinds of work we do, you know, where do you see competence that people celebrate teams. success grades, you know? Sports teams. Sports teams, right. Um, or even like universities, right. Like where you are like, you know, did you get an A grade, you know, what's your GPA, you know? So um, cultivation culture will be more like, you know, um, it's either my vision or not, you know, so like any kind of a group party, like faith, you know, like religious uh, things, you know, um, and then this is where control culture could be like, um, you know, where most of, unfortunately, the US organizations heavily are on the control culture still, you know, um, so control culture is like, it's a, you will see like lots of organizations, senior manager, manager of manager, right? Um, like in, 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 like, for example, in one engagement, um, this is in a place called Hyderabad, India, there were 1,500 people and there were 24 levels of management in them, right? And, and super heavy, hierarchy heavy. So nothing, everything needed approval, nothing was getting done, right? So control culture, right? And collaboration culture is where we succeed by working together, right? So every leader, each one of us has the, has the uh, we, can, we can do these cultures if we want, 
but generally innovation works well you know so when you do this kind of model you will see the the trend is more on this side would be useful but essentially when you really look at it every every group is more like a spider chart they're all around this and then we think about how can we move the move the curve left you know and so that's what i mean is if we can't do that then like we're only focused up here on scrum kanban and all of that we really can't create a creative organization where people are celebrated for what they know uh, and not necessarily for what the organization you know and all of those rules and regulations right so um so we spoke about dual track agile and there are some links around jeff uh, jeff patton site you can read more about it essentially the idea is you put your idea backlog you ha have every team discover and put your regular work as well and have every team combine the product management and product team into one team and pull work from that and do whatever scrum scrum ban is required for that you know and don't force teams to do like large scale scrum and safe and all these massively waterfall uh, things we have come up with lately, like, you know, less than safe, let's not do that, right? So, um, and then some definitions on innovation are here as well. And we spoke about the ID8 prototype scale, right? So with that, folks, um, I just want to thank you uh, for the time. And I open up for any questions, thoughts uh, from there. So I'll stop sharing and open up for conversations. I think Chris has stopped recording maybe, and maybe then people will ask questions, maybe. You know. All right. Well, so before we stop recording, I'll say, uh, uh, Babu, thank you very much for sharing all of this with us uh, today. Rock on. Thank you. Woohoo. And uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and stop recording and see if people have some questions. <laughs>